So we're going to begin tonight with Galatians chapter 1, and we're going to go through five verses. We're only going to get through five verses tonight. But starting with verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul begins the book of Galatians by declaring that he is an apostle, which almost seems, you know, it'd be kind of strange if, if I began every conversation or every letter, Josh McElwee, a pastor, you know, like, why are you, why are you saying that? Why are you asserting that? But the reason is because his apostleship was often challenged. And these people that would come in, like the Judaizers, that would come in and they would try to, you know, bring error and heresy, the, the, the first place they started was by undermining Paul's authority. And well, is he really an apostle? He wasn't one of the original 12. You know, so they would undermine his authority. And he makes the point, I am an apostle. And not only am I an apostle, but I am an apostle who was appointed directly by Jesus Christ. And that's a reference to the road to Damascus where he encountered God. I mean, he, you know, he was persecuting the church, persecuting Jesus. And then he encountered God and God made him an apostle. He says God made him an apostle to the Gentiles specifically in one place. So he says, look, he's establishing his authority saying, I have the right to speak into your life. I have the right to, to teach you and tell you these things and to, and to bring this word of correction into your life because I am an apostle. And in, in, in one way what he's saying is not, not only am I an apostle, I'm your apostle because he's the one that planted these churches. And the first thing that comes to my mind when I read that is it's important for every believer to know who should be able to speak into their life. And a lot of, a lot of believers don't know that. They, they don't they haven't clearly determined in their mind who has a right to speak into your life. And the Galatians really shouldn't have needed Paul to tell them, I have a right to speak into your life. They should have already known that. They should have known that Paul planted that church. Paul's the one who first brought them the gospel. He, he, it really shouldn't have been necessary for him to establish that authority and saying, I have the right to speak into your life. But for us, it's the same. We need to know who has the right to speak into my life. And the answer for a lot of people is, well, nobody. It is, you know, if you stop, who has the right to speak into your life? A lot of people, they don't have a right. No, nobody has a right to speak into their life. They just, they don't have anyone that can bring correction and bring instruction into their life. And, and um, sometimes if, if they do have that, then it's very difficult for the person to, to bring that. So that's one of the first things I get out of this passage when he says, I am an apostle and I have the right to speak this into your life. It's like, man, I just wish he didn't even have to say that. I wish they got this already. You know, and, and, for, and for modern day Christians, same thing. We should, we should have that line of communication open so that the people that should have that right, they know they have it and they can speak it into their life. For me, uh, you know, we have a board at our church, uh, an external board. Pastor John Welch, Brother Greg Fritz, Pastor Sam Carr, that they know that they have that line of communication into my life. It's not questioned. They don't, every time they need to tell me something, they don't have to start out by saying, now, Josh, you know I'm on your board, and, and I have a lot of wisdom, and I have a lot of experience. I need you to listen to what I have to say. That's not even necessary. They just come out and say it because they know they have that, that right. So he says, I am an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, and all the brothers who are with me. So he says, I, Paul, an apostle, am writing this letter, and all the brothers who are with me. Now this is a small point, but it's an interesting point. At almost, in almost every letter that Paul writes, he identifies a co-author of his letters, which almost never get credit for writing the letters. It's, almost, you know, it's always Paul, 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 Paul. But in the majority of his letters, all but except one or two, he mentions a co-author. Now, it's very probable that he was saying, we are greeting you, because he says, you know, Paul and all the brothers who are with me. He's basically saying, we greet you, we send you our love, we send you our peace. But 
if we compare it to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, this is how Paul starts his introduction. He says, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, he establishes his authority again, and our brother Sothenes. So he mentions specifically, I'm writing this with Sothenes. Now, I don't know that these people actually wrote anything in the book, or is it more that they were sitting down together kind of, discussing beforehand, you know, what needs to be written to the Corinthians, what needs to be written to the Galatians, much in the same way that, you know, maybe a church staff or pastors would discuss, hey, what do we need to address in this meeting, and then the pastor addresses it. But in every book, uh, Second Second Corinthians, he mentions Timothy. Uh, Philippians is Timothy. Colossians is Timothy. First Thessalonians is Silvanus and Timothy. Second Thessalonians is Silvanus and Timothy. Philemon is Timothy. So Timothy is mentioned as a co-author in many of these, and it's no different in Galatians. He says, I, Paul, and the brothers who are with me write this letter to you. The reason I think that's important is that even Paul the Apostle was not a Lone Ranger. You know, he's not just somebody out there who's this super apostle that's doing all this work by himself and has no support and no help and, and no you know, support from anyone. No, he ever in every single letter that he writes, he says, I'm writing this with this person, you know, or, or, or several people that are, are with him, helping him. And even when he traveled, he always traveled with Barnabas or Silas, you know, or Timothy or Luke. So Paul, it, I'm just saying that because it's important for Christians to, to realize today that, you know, we're all dependent on each other. We're all dependent on the body of Christ. Even Paul the Apostle was dependent on that. Verse 3, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is so standard of a greeting for all of Paul's letters that it almost becomes numb when you hear it because he, he almost starts every one of his letters and he, he ends almost all of his letters by saying, Grace and peace to you. But you know, this is not really something that you want to just skip over. It's very significant. He's doing that for a reason because really it's a prayer or a blessing that he's praying over those people. I believe when he said those words, I believe he was saying them with faith. I believe he was saying, I am praying for grace for you, and I am praying for peace for you. And that peace flows from God the Father and from Jesus Christ his Son. He's saying, I'm praying for that for you. I'm believing that for you. So when we read these words, you don't ever want to just skip over grace and peace to you from God the Father, Lord Jesus Christ. No. Paul is praying for grace that the Christian life that you've been called to live, that you, it will be empowered by grace. And not only will it be empowered by grace, but that you will be filled with the peace of God that passes understanding, that, that you'll live every day full of that peace that only God can give. And so it's, it's not just something to skip over, even though it's kind of a standard introduction. It's a prayer, and it's a blessing. And I, and I think when you read this as a believer that even today you can still receive nourishment from those words. I mean, even today when I read that, grace to you. I believe Paul's talking to me. You know, when I read it, grace to you and peace from God the Father. Let's read verse 3 again. He said, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself. Who gave himself. This is such a crucial part of Christian doctrine and, and understanding that Jesus Christ died voluntarily. God did not make him do it, he gave himself. And you see this phrase, this phraseology throughout all the New Testament. Paul says it over and over. I could, there's probably close to 50 scriptures that where he says he gave himself. Jesus Christ gave himself. It was voluntary, even though it was the will of God. God did not make him do it. Jesus chose to do it. He gave his life voluntarily for you. The clearest place that we see this is in Matthew chapter 26, verse 51. It says, And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now, we know that was Peter. And I admire Peter for that, but, you know, he, was out, he stepped out of bounds again. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? So what Jesus was saying to Peter is, I am dying voluntarily. 
God's not making me do this. No one's making me do this. If I called to my father, he would at once, and he would immediately send me 12 legions of angels to rescue me and deliver me. This is voluntary. This is, this is a choice that I am making. And so it's a crucial part of our understanding as believers to realize that, that it was voluntary. It's the same way that we serve God today. It's voluntarily. God's not making you live for Him. God's not making you serve Him. Every day we get up and we live for God, it's voluntary. Our prayer life is voluntary. Our giving is voluntary. Our service is voluntary. And I believe Christ lived His life that way. I believe every day He woke up and He made a conscious choice. I'm a servant of God. I'm living for Him. It was a voluntary choice He made every day. And so that pattern carried all the way to the cross where when it came time for him to make that most difficult decision, he was so used to submitting his will under the will of God that I won't say it was an easy choice because we see that it was difficult, but he was able to make that choice. And so for us to learn from that is Christ is our example. And as he voluntarily laid his life down for us, we voluntarily lay our life down for the gospel every day. So it says, Jesus Christ, who gave himself, then he tells us why, for our sins. This is such a basic understanding that we, we, we hear and so much that we lose the value in it sometimes. But understand, Christ died for your sins. It's because of your sin that Christ had to die. It's for your sins and my sins that Christ had to pay the ultimate price that he paid, and he did it willingly. We see this also in 1 Timothy 1.15 where Paul writes, he says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost, Paul says. So Paul is restating there, and it's restated multiple times in the New Testament, the reason why Christ came was to die for our sins. And he said, and he, I just love how he adds that part. He says, he came in the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Another translation says, of whom I am the chief of all, of all sinners. So he had that full understanding that he was a sinner. I made the point last Sunday, that's not Paul's primary view of himself. He's not constantly walking around, you know, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. He understood who he was in Christ, that he's the righteousness of God in Christ. But it's just a good thing to meditate on from time to time to realize that you know, it's because of my sin that Christ had to come. And if it weren't for that, then he wouldn't have had to. To deliver us from the present evil age. He gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. Or you could say to deliver us from the effects of this present evil age. That's probably a little bit clearer way of saying that. I want to read 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 to bring a little bit of light on that statement. It says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So this present evil age, one of the things that, that it does and that happens is it keeps people from seeing the light of the gospel. And he says that Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from those effects. In other words, to deliver us from that blindness, to deliver us from that deception. And when I think about that, I, I, I'm so grateful and thankful when I wake up and I think about, I'm not blind anymore. I'm not deceived anymore. And no, no one can undeceive themselves. You know, no one can bring sight when you're blind. It's, it's Christ that brings it. And he said, he died for that purpose to set you free, to open your eyes to see the light. Even though you were in darkness, blinded in darkness, completely deceived by the devil, it was Christ's work on the cross that set you free, opened your eyes, and removed that, that spiritual blindness. So when he says to remove the effects of, of this present age, he's saying the effects that cause you to remain in your sin, the effects that cause you to remain in darkness. Then he goes on to say that all of this was according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is another crucial part of Christian doctrine, which is that it was the will of God for Christ to die. God sovereignly willed it and planned it from the very beginning that this was the path 
And this was the way that he would redeem mankind. And of course, Jesus voluntarily submitted himself to that. But it's crucial in our understanding that it was the will of God. It was God's will that it would happen this way. We see this most clearly in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was praying right before he was crucified. And he said, Lord, if there's any way that this cup can pass before me, let it be done. But not my will, your will be done. So you see those two different wills at work there. And uh, Jesus still had his own will. He had his will, then there was God's will. And he was battling with that in that moment. So we see that the will of, it was the will of God for the cup not to pass from, from Christ. But as we saw earlier, he could have chosen for it to pass. But he, he chose to submit his will under God's will. So it was the will of God for him to die. Now, this is just in the first five verses of, of Galatians. There's all this right in just those first five verses. And it's really just Paul's greeting. But even in that simple greeting, we get all this doctrinal truth just packed into those five verses. And it's right after this that he jumps right into addressing the, the Galatians and the Judaizers. And so we're going to get into that next week.